Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Carr. I go by Harky. I'm a fourth year uh, resident uh, at UH um, Hospital Psychiatry Department in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And my name is Aaron Vasquez. Uh, I'm a UMHS uh, alumni as well. Um, I did my uh, undergraduate training in psychology and then uh, middle school school with you guys and then residency at uh, in Cleveland as well University Hospitals uh, case uh, medical center and uh, Harky and I both specialize in psychiatry which is a four-year uh, program um, I was on the island with the family and uh, for the most part it was a good experience um, and then uh, you know I would say residency was too in Ohio um, now I am an attending uh, physician in Utah at Intermountain Healthcare uh, in Southern Utah. And I'm the medical director there uh, on a unit where we have 18 inpatient beds. And then we do consults and uh, things like that throughout the hospital. So when uh, Scott reached out to Harky and I uh, to do this uh, Facebook Live, we we're both pretty excited about uh, sharing some information and some thoughts about, you know, a field we've dedicated our lives to and love a lot. So the way that we thought uh, we would, um, uh, the best way to kind of maybe present the, the information, I'll present the topic and then kind of turn it over to Harky, um, is, you know, this week is Suicide Prevention Week. And um, in, in, in rather, in kind of knowing our audience, rather than, uh, you know, keeping our, our comments and presentation um, uh, focused on, on the general population, we thought this would be a great opportunity to focus on those who are probably listening, um, which are caregivers, medical students, um, uh, maybe some physicians or staff, um, because um, we're uh, especially at risk for this, this topic that we're going to be talking about. And so being able to identify and then knowing what to do, I think is very important to be able to support one another. Um, so we, we hope that uh, you personally will benefit from this. And if and if not, um, hopefully you'll be able to benefit someone you know or care about um, either now or later in your training or when you are a doctor one day. Um, you'll be able to recognize uh, the signs of a colleague who might be struggling and then uh, not feel helpless yourself, but kind of know, uh, you know what to do um, if, you're, if you're concerned about somebody uh, that you're working with. Um, before we do get into the topic, uh, I want to use this form for just a moment to plug psychiatry. Um, it's not a common field, I think, for UMHS uh, students to apply to or to match into. Um, probably 30 years ago, this was a wastebasket kind of uh, residency. Um, that is psychiatry. In other words, if you couldn't get into something else, people would default into uh, psychiatry. And the tides have turned big time. Uh, it's one of the most competitive residencies there is. We didn't have any unfilled spots in the match um, that went into the, the soap. Um, uh, we might've had one or two, but it wasn't because uh, the normal reasons why a residency wouldn't match. Um, it, uh, so I, I am, I'm a big fan, it's very rewarding. Um, you get to, to know people at a much uh, deeper level than you would. Um, uh, you know, treating them in a different field. Um, uh, it also pays very well, um, despite, you know, what you see on Medscape and things like that. It, it does pay extremely well. Um, you don't have to touch people. There's a lot of uh, great uh, reasons, you know, um, to, to choose psychiatry. So if anyone has any uh, interest or um, questions about this field that, that you might be considering, I know Harky would be happy to talk to you and and I would too. I think the world needs more uh, good uh, psychiatrists. There's definitely a big shortage. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Harky and she is going to uh, talk to you about what she's going to talk to you about. So um, I, uh, I agree with Erin. I think out of our UMHS program, since the school have started, there's maybe only 12 of us who have gone into psychiatry or maybe 10 to 12 so not a very big number and i think um it it's one of the best fields to get into and i would highly encourage 
people uh, or students to apply into psychiatry because we are we are in shortage and um, uh, patients need us and I think it's one of the one of the good fields to get into so definitely consider um, from there on I, I wanted to talk a little bit about like uh, you know just the national uh, suicide prevention week that we have um, like people have become more comfortable like increase increasingly comfortable about like talking about their mental health especially since last year since the pandemic because we've been in a lot of isolation and we um, we we find ways to reach out to people to find to just have a chat, um, you know, just to feel comfortable. But I think the topic of suicide, when it comes up, is still scary for many people to talk about, and which can go unnoticed at times. And uh, one of the one of the best, I think, one of the one of the bigger things that we can do is, especially for our friends or family members or neighbors whoever we feel comfortable with to just reach out and see if they were doing okay. Just sometimes texting a friend or a family member and checking out the, on their health is very important because I know we're all busy. We often tend to just uh, think about, okay, I'll reach out to this person maybe tomorrow, but I think a small text can make a big F like a day for somebody. Um, so it is it is time to deepen this conversation where we, we should spread more awareness among um, especially professionals like us who are working in high stressors and uh, um, environment and medical school itself is is quite demanding and especially being on the island you you are already isolated from your family Aaron was lucky he had his uh, family there but I um, it was a big adjustment for me because I was there just by myself on a, on a newer place and didn't really know anybody and the classes were difficult and it did took a like it takes a toll so um i think just being around and making that group of friends that you can trust and be there for each other is is a bigger and better things like you can um, help out each other um and i know like some like some are afraid that by talking or by asking someone if they are having tr thoughts of harming themselves can put them into this thing that, oh my God, like this person is just, you know, having a mental breakdown or they're not stable enough, uh, but that's not the case. Um, our mental health is as important as any other um, physical health, I believe. Like we, I know we go to the doctors to get our annual checkups and I think mental health checkups should be done the same way as well, because that's one of the topics that kind of get unnoticed at times. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk a little bit about, and then I can ask Erin to uh, take part in it. I think you're muted. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, I think it's important to know when we say that, like, physicians are at increased risk for suicide, what that means. Like, you know, um, the first time I heard this, the, the general statistic of, 12 people per 100,000 is what the average, you know, around, uh, give or take every year, it changes a little bit. Um, and that's been trending up. Um, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot and it's cause it's not 12 people per 100,000. Um, and so I thought that might be kind of hard as a psychiatrist to figure out if I lined up 100,000 people, pick out 12 and that those are those who are gonna complete suicide. Many more people attempt, you know? Um, uh, however, it wouldn't be so hard to pick out the physicians in the lineup, um, because if you know that they're uh, physicians, um, you know that it's going to be three to four times, uh, you know, the, 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 um, than the general population. So it's roughly 30 to 40, you know, per 100,000 that, that uh, comes out to, um, you know, three to 400 physicians a year um you know you can begin these numbers begin to get a little bit more real this is why uh we say you know a doctor will kill himself every single day uh you know of, of the year um and it won't take long if you don't already know somebody if you continue this uh, in this field long enough um you, you will be impacted by this it's not really when it's just i'm sorry it's not a matter if it's more of a matter of when this might occur and so um, recognizing that this, just the profession, 
is a static risk factor, you know, um, that really is not likely to change for most of us aren't going to change professions. Um, you know, what, what we can do, you know, uh, kind of about that. If you're wondering what the, the risks are with medical students, um, it's uh, three times likelier to die by suicide than your friends who have not gone to, uh, you know, medical school. So um, that's pretty sobering. Um, with the, the statistic being three to four times higher for physicians, that makes you more likely to die by suicide than someone who's coming from the military, you know, who's been in war, you know. Um, and uh, for those of us who've trained at the VA and, uh, you know, kind of other places, you know, that that's already a pretty high risk, uh, you know, like population. And so to put yourself um, statistically, at least, uh at a higher risk that's pretty sobering um it's so sobering that you know they made a, a um a movie about this uh, uh phenomena you know that that's been happening um but kind of hidden actually um so the ivory tower doesn't really want you to know this um the uh major uh, training institutions uh um uh, do not make a big deal out of this and some have made an effort to hide, you know, suicides that have been occurring in residencies, uh, in medical schools. And so if you want to see kind of a, an expose, if you're interested in just like learning more about that, um, it's, uh, the movie is called, uh, Do No Harm. And it's, uh, about exposing the Hippocratic hoax. Okay. Um, is kind of the title of the movie. And I think you can get that on Amazon or um, uh, one of those, you know, outlets, I think is kind of where I saw it. Actually, I saw it in the, I saw it when I was in training in the movie theater when it first came out and then I saw it again on later on TV. It's, it's really good. It's, it's definitely uh, very moving because it's, uh, the movie is done um, with families and other residents who've been impacted by their family member, their colleague, uh who have died by suicide um some who've jumped off their hospital roof and and others who they found hanging uh you know at work and it's very very troubling uh things but again something that i think is uh, moving in a good way difficult to watch difficult to hear because you'll identify as being in the medical profession um but uh you know necessary we can't kind of keep closing our eyes to this and uh, certainly not um, hiding, uh, you know, what, what, what is happening, um, you know, in our field. Um, this was made before the pandemic, you know, before um, things were at kind of where they are, um, you know, today. So, um, Har Harky, were you going to talk about uh, some of the warning signs to look out for, or was I going to focus on that in my part? Um, so I, I could do I that. Gonna, yeah, I mean, okay. so I think one of the... Yeah, one of the things that I was going to uh, talk about is what are some of the warning signs where um, a, a person is thinking about or having a plan or even thinking about suicide is just, you know, just just to screen them for if there's any underlying depression going on, if there is an anxiety or if they're just, you know, um, having any other personal stressors like maybe not doing so well in classes, worried about step like studying for that or having just going through personal problems such as like um, just uh, trouble with their partners or anything like that and then they're I think they, the other thing is just being isolation and not really taking care of themselves sometimes patient people just will still be coming to classes and they'll just be you know unkempt or not eating losing weight or gaining weight and all of those things can kind of warn you to a thing that hey you look a little different from when I've seen you like last, what's going on? I think that those can be some of those signs that to just watch for that can be easily neglected in, um, especially like um, in uh, schools or even in residency because we are high functioning uh, people and uh, we can, uh, sometimes we can just hide things and we're, we're, we're good at doing that. But I think um, just keeping those signs in mind is uh, uh, I think, could lead to some opening of conversation and just 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 giving that support i think would be then afterwards is better so that's kind of what i wanted to just just keep it in like basic and simple approach uh is is a great way to go by add a couple things to that um some is okay if i add a couple of things to that yeah 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, some some things that I've personally seen um, that are uh, pretty significant risk factors are, um, you know, if someone's going to be getting uh, reprimanded or dismissed from medical school or a training program. Um, this is like life altering experience. Um, in fact, like in my hospital, um, we have a very good um, hospital medical director who's mindful of the physician's mental health. And anytime he is going to bring a physician in to have a, a life changing discussion, meaning a, a credentialing issue, uh, you know, needing to let them go, or put them on suspension, things like that, um, there's always a mental health consult as well. Uh, because we, as you know, physicians, we, we our identity is closely linked, you know, with uh, our profession because we've given so much to this. And so, if something negative is going to happen to us professionally, uh, it definitely has a, a lot of you know personal impact. Um, this can be like if you know someone's license is getting you know restricted. This commonly happens if there's like severe malpractice issues or um, substance abuse issues uh, where patients are in, in harm's way um, is when this can happen. But if someone feels humiliated, shamed, uh, and they start telling you they have no purpose, you know, anymore, um, you know, in their life, they're having life events. Harky mentioned like uh, relationship issues. If someone's going through a divorce or a pretty bad breakup with a partner, um that has previously been a good support um you know to them then that can be uh you know again significant uh risk factors and if you have any if you have more than one of these problems you know you have several of these risk factors then the concern you know gets that much greater i think also like it's only by like learning more about what leads someone towards having these thoughts um uh, like the way we can help to, to prevent it and what resources are available and uh, not being afraid to like ask when we are worried about someone or for for help um, when we need it even for ourselves um, that can empower our communities to address like you know just the lead, leading cause of death um, I think just keeping that in mind sometimes um we as uh, like ourselves we we try to think that okay we're fine like as professionals but um there comes a time when you bring in some heavy um load at home from just by seeing some some really difficult patients and just i think decompressing at home by doing certain activities that's helpful um is is also to keep that in mind for own for your own wellness as well it's very important Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk for, you know, a couple a couple minutes um, uh, about the substance use issue specifically. Um, and because this has actually changed, I think, since I was in training, um, we're just seeing a lot more of it, uh, you know, to be honest. Um, uh, part of that is people staying home, uh, being in isolation, I think boredom. Um, you know, accounts for that. And as you guys are aware, you know, not all drugs are created equal. Um, some are definitely more lethal than others. Um, but 13% of Americans said that they have um, increased their substance use uh, just as a way of dealing with, uh, you know, the stress and the emotions related to the pandemic. Some of the people have had uh, major job um, changes or maybe loss of employment. Um, and so, you know, some, an unhealthy coping skill that people use to deal with that distress, uh, you know, can be to, to turn to a substance that they previ previously used or maybe begin, you know, trying new substances. Um, and so there's been an increase of close to 18% uh, of uh, overdose deaths since there were some stay at home orders last year. Um, and uh, also to, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the overall deaths, though, in 2020 were, were, um, uh, were that are substance related. It's 50% uh, more, you know, that that are that are on the rise, and so that's sobering, pun intended. Uh, you know, st statistics um, compared because we use a lot of substances in this country, anyways. Um, but so to have an increase already on kind of a, a, a somewhat high level of substance use at our baseline. 
um, you know, is, is certainly worrisome. Um, a lot of people, especially with changes in regulations, have turned to cannabis, uh, you know, using that much more um, frequently than we've seen since it's been somewhat destigmatized, but also just more available and prevalent. It's fairly easy, at least in the state of Utah and many other states to access that in a, dispens in a dispensary. And, um, you know, certainly uh, not that um, marijuana in and of itself is a bad thing, but when someone's already uh, struggling mentally, um, you know, we usually don't uh, recommend that, you know, as a, as a, as a treatment, um, uh, there's probably more risk than rewards um from from that and that would certainly be the case with alcohol as well i think there's also um i i work in a college mental health clinic once a week and we've also seen uh, an increased um i guess a rise in in um just in demand of uh, stimulants as well because the students now were taking all the classes from home um, and uh, one of the issues that was thing is they they brought up that they're unable to really concentrate during like live lectures or Zoom lectures, and uh, a majority of were, were getting tested for ADHD who were really didn't really have any of these symptoms previously. So there has been an increase um, rise in stimulant um, use as well. Um, that um, is one of the one of the other things that I have personally noticed that I you know, um, especially like in college students. There you go, gotta keep remembering to unmute things here. Um, so, you know, we, uh, one of the questions that, um, for an interview that uh, Scott did with me is whether we should take someone's thoughts, uh, suicidal thoughts, you know, seriously or not. Um, it was told to me and uh, I think, I don't know if it was undergrad or medical school that, oh, well, if they're talking about it, they're not going to do it. You know, it's the people that stay quiet and you don't know until it's done that actually complete. If you take anything away from this, you know, uh, Facebook live event, know that that is not true. Um, certainly the people that do not talk about it and complete um, is sad and it, it does happen there is those folks but a lot of people actually do there are warning signs um you know uh, people um uh so one of the major risk factors that we work uh, deal with on a uh, on a regular basis is uh inpatient hospitalization so if someone has been hospitalized in psychiatry on an inpatient psych ward when they leave they're at a much greater risk uh, not because something necessarily happened during the hospital stay that was negative or anything like that, but it's just because they're already in a class of sicker people than maybe those who have more mild to moderate depression. And so um, uh, certainly these people who are getting admitted, you know, to an inpatient ward, uh, physicians included, I have one actually here now, a pathologist uh, from out of state, um, you know, getting care, um, uh, they do talk about uh, these thoughts um, and uh, particularly early before they become totally hopeless um, they will make some help seeking efforts and um, to brush those aside and dismiss those would be like a terrible mistake uh, and so it's something that maybe um, you might even regret you know if, if it were to happen later and so if there's if you're ever going to err on whether to do something or do nothing i would always err on the side of you know safety um, so about 50 percent of the physicians um, that have uh, uh, died by suicide um, have been diagnosed with a mental health condition and the other 50 percent haven't and so for those who haven't spoken anything to anybody who aren't diagnosed i would suspect that they fall into the category of not talking about their suicidal thoughts publicly or with a you know with a close friend um, and the other 50%, you know, that, that uh, are diagnosed, um, obviously have been talking about this in order to get the diagnosis, right? So it's not so uh, black and white in terms of, um, if, you know, whether you're talking about it or you're not. And as, as Harky said in the beginning, um, uh, you know, you asking somebody, um, uh, you know, wanting to be uh, involved and helpful, that's not going to increase the risk that they do it. OK, uh, if anything, it's only going to help. So never think that you would be causing them to be more depressed or more embarrassed or, or more of anything 
that would lead them closer to ending their life by asking questions. Questions are benign. I think I agree because sometimes we um, tend to hold back because by not asking and, and thinking that if we do if we do bring this topic up with somebody, we are kind of planting this idea in their brain or maybe they will just then go ahead and do it. Um, that's certainly not true. Um, I think asking somebody and being just there as a support is very important and uh, just not uh, like Aaron said, it's not true that you, you're not you're not really giving them any ideas or thoughts. You're just there to help out. So it is very important to um, be a good listener and be very empathetic and know when to talk and know when to just just have a good like be a good listener. I think is is a great tool to um, to have for 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 each other. So um, Harvey talked a little bit about what some of the signs look like and some of the symptoms that you might, you know, uh, observe. And I, and I spoke about a little bit about the, um, the life events that can occur um, in someone uh, to be mindful of um, that may draw your attention, uh, for, you know, if they're at a high risk. Um, it's, you know, now let's just shift a little bit to like what, uh, what might we do, you know, when we we find someone um, who one of our colleagues, a medical student or a resident or physician, um, other healthcare worker that is, is, is really struggling. Um, one of the, I mean, I think the, the most important thing to do is to make it known that you're a bit emotionally available, you know, to them that, uh, and I underestimated the power of this and, until I was in residency training. I thought I always needed to be doing something like, um, and I underestimated the power of just being present um, because as physicians, we're trying to problem solve, especially as a man, right? That's what we do, we, we're problem solvers. Um, and so uh, getting into that mode isn't the best mode to be in, uh, in the mode of trying to solve someone's problems and finding them solutions and things like that. Um, it's really, uh, being just present and being with somebody and that can be curative you know um, depending on what's going on uh, you would be surprised how few people can tolerate a fairly depressing conversation with someone you know like so they may not find that solace in friends that they have uh, in family um, and a loved one because maybe those other people are suffering and you know can't tolerate that discussion and there's also this kind of thought that it's contagious you know that oh my goodness someone is so depressed and anxious and i'm going to become that way too if i talk to this person and listen to this person for too long let me see how quickly i can kind of get out of this you know and so i think that's why it's so valuable is because since that's the inclination to avoid these uncomfortable conversations and discussions um why not doing that and being present is why that's so helpful you know, um, because it's refreshing to have someone that can um, have the wherewith, you know, to, to, to tolerate these like difficult discussions. So definitely opening, a, a, you know, a, an, op a, an ear, you know, for someone to, um, you know, uh, listen to, um, I think is really, you know, really, really helpful. Just uh, a lot of times, you know, one of the defense mechanisms we use is to uh, suppress, repress, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And, um, you know, it's, it's like a pressure cooker, you know, um, this is why journaling can be helpful for someone or, you know, just again, just speaking, uh, sometimes uh, a referral will be appropriate to a therapist uh, You could refer them to um, uh, a psychiatrist is usually kind of last line, um, you know, for someone to, to get to. Um, Sometimes that's appropriate too, maybe referral if they're already on a medication or something like that. But um, people usually start with uh, talking to like a counselor or therapist. Sometimes people go in and talk to the primary care uh, physician for like resources um, and that would be good too. Once you're um, employed as a resident, I don't think in medical school this is available, but in residency it is pretty much everywhere. And, once if and if you're employed by a kind of a larger organization they'll have these employee assistance programs eap and uh 
This is temporary access. Well, one part of it is temporary access to mental health. And it can be a real lifesaver because they have availability. They can usually see people the same day or fairly quickly. Um, and sometimes going into the community to get that help could take longer, like weeks, maybe months even in certain areas. So EAP program can be a great uh, resource to refer someone to one of your colleagues to if you're concerned. And I kind of wanted to um, talk a little bit more about like sometimes we just like Aaron mentioned earlier, like we don't know the ways to start a conversation about suicide. Like how do we ask somebody without um, kind of putting them in this spot? And like some some of the ways you guys can ask them like, hey, like, you know, I'm, I have been uh, feeling concerned about you lately or you know, recently I've noticed like some differences in you and wondering what's going on. And I think these this is can be like a easy opening um, T like talk you can have or you can say like I wanted to check in with you because you haven't been you know you haven't seen yourself lately um, can kind of have a very open-ended kind of conversation and or you can say that you know and then then you can ask them further like when did you start feeling like this like did something happen that make you start feeling this way like I think this these are some of the easiest ways to kind of um, get somebody else to talk um, is um, is the like how can be how can you be the best support to them like or are they currently having any thoughts of getting any help like I, I think just the basic not to put anybody on a spot but just to be like have a basic conversation can go long ways yes definitely um I, and i think language matters too and i don't want to put any pressure on the listeners to have uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, obsessing about the ways to ask questions and, the, and what to say to people. Again, because I think the most important thing is just being present. But there are a couple tips I would give you on um, some ways to talk to folks who are in a dark hole. Um, uh, one of those ways is if you're going to ask just somebody directly, you know, if they're contemplating suicide, I'd avoid using the word commit. You know, we commit crimes, we commit other heinous acts in society, but, you know, um, this is a term that's kind of fallen out of favor when we talk about uh, suicide. We usually talk about dying by suicide or, you know, uh, death by suicide or self-harming or, or kind of more destigmatizing um, types of terms because um, once someone has completed or committed died by suicide, there I go, I was going to use it, um, uh, you know, nobody's charged. You know, there's no, there's no uh, legal, uh, you know, matter. Uh, so it's just uh, a term that kind of was used historically that has, you know, and, and continues to kind of be used. Um, but I, I think uh, kind of moving away from that um, gets rid of the, the judgment um, and treating someone like kind of like a criminal, you know, if they're not doing well and they're having uh, you know, suicidal thoughts. Something else that, um, you know, I, I found to be helpful when in working with um, a colleague or, or a friend who's having a hard time is using the word we, you know, like um, we should or let's, you know, this infers that you're going to be there with them through this, that you're going to be there as an emotional support um, to, you know, guide them through this like challenging time. Um, and so it infers, you know, caring and um, an open an open ear um, to that. Um, any other thoughts on that, Harky? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, I, I'm glad you, you said that, you know, it's not a like when we say committed, then it kind of becomes like you're committing a crime. It's it's really isn't that. And I think some of the other things that we also need to focus on, like, what are the some what are what are like we, we we said that these are the things you should be doing but what are the some of the things that you should not be doing is like you know just argue with somebody who's trying to tell you their problems and you know or act shocked that oh my god like do, are you really having these thoughts like you know just just uh, or promise them like any kind of confidentiality if you really can't um or like blame yourself or you know offer like ways to fix your loved one's problems because certain things you really can't fix and you just are only there for them i think just giving them certain it's good to give them hope but i think when that increases to a different level um then 
it can also cause a little bit of friction in your relationship as well so keep that and keeping that in mind is also very important i think so i think um another and kind of important thing to you know a resource to to make uh everyone aware is um you know the the national suicide prevention lifeline uh number um i think there was a song uh this i don't know if this is the same number or not about uh that the 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 song was made from but the I would just want to tell you the number now it's uh 1-800-273-8255 that's 1-800-273-8255 and um uh anybody can call that and the idea behind a suicide hotline isn't that the person on the other line is going to convince someone to not end their life they're not they're doing what I recommended you do which is just be present just listen uh buy them some time because uh urges to end your, to end the, someone's life uh passes okay with the the passage of time okay so it's not going to always remain as intense um and so keeping someone on the phone and talking to them allows them to again kind of vent and if you know they need additional help and they're not getting better while talking to the person on the hotline then certainly they're going to try and you know get them to a hospital if there's uh, you know immediate concerns to to keep that person safe So this is a number that I think in a resource that uh you should put in your cell phone, save it and have it available um to share with uh your patients, your colleagues um if uh you know at 2 a.m. in the morning they need to talk to somebody and uh you know it's open um you know like 24 hours. Um are there any resources for this audience Hector that you think would be good to share aside from like uh, a national number or I yes. talked about EAP a little bit but Um I there is also you can um I think you can also get this there's a 1-800-273 talk I don't know if that's the same number as what you had mentioned but that's there, there's that and there's also I think text messages as well that's available that you can send crisis line um there's a national crisis line where you can just text if you don't feel like talking um and these people reach out to you and then they will call you and then um i think there's a helpline in our it's uh it's called IASP as well i don't know if, if you you know that one um i don't know if there's like a number of lists of numbers there as well that's listed um so you can find in in on that website basically you can find any crisis line through the counties as well if you don't want to call the national line so there are like different numbers um that are available on um, our APA websites as well so i just that's kind of what i think i have the knowledge of okay so i want to i want to kind of remind everybody to post some questions in the in the comments um we think we're going to be be moving to that here in a couple seconds um or shortly uh, we wanted to be mindful of your time we know you guys are all busy um there's a lot more we could definitely talk about but we want to answer some some questions for you and so we're going to start um you know start that here soon um uh, kind of probably the last thing I just want to mention um kind of some concluding uh, remarks for me is um as a healthcare provider you're going to have to take ownership of your own mental health. You're going to have to don't expect or be passive about this. Don't think that your medical school, your training program, your parents, your loved one, anybody is going to look out for you, okay? You have to be very proactive and uh so when it's vacation time, you have to take it. You know, you may not get it. You may not be given, you know, that you have to take it. Okay? You have to take vacation, you have to take time off when you're off. You need to be off. You need to not be checking emails, screening phone calls. You need to develop a life outside of training and medicine um so that you're not vulnerable, okay? If uh your career doesn't go as planned or uh you lose a patient or more, um uh, this has happened to me um uh several on several occasions and I have personally benefited from uh my own EAP program and uh in psychiatry residency doing my own uh therapy for 2 years. That was extremely helpful to me to be able to to cope and deal with the um um the reality you know um that that you're going to see and and hear and so uh there's certainly no shame in it i think therapy can benefit anybody um even the the well you know um uh, but certainly someone who's struggling with their own mental health might benefit from that more so 
you know, you have to put your own mask on first before you can help other people. And you have to, um, uh, you know, find what works for you. We can make a ton of recommendations on things that are kind of evidence-based um, to help you stay well and grounded. Um, uh, but ultimately it's going to come down to what works with your personality, your time, your resources, you know, uh, what you're willing to kind of put into it. But some things that are, are free, you know, are um, uh, becoming a ninja at, you know, mindfulness, um, you know, activities and meditation. Some people um, launch into that from uh, some yoga. Kundalini yoga is particularly helpful for, um, I think, mental health. There's a spiritual dimension to that. Um, uh, you know, obviously eating well, exercising. These are kind of some common sense things that sometimes we we don't put it at the forefront. We don't think about it with our mental health. We just think about it maybe for the physical part of our health. Um, but there's, as we're all one, you know, we're all, uh, you know, from a holistic perspective, we're mind body you know is, is is really one so if you're doing something for your body it's likely to impact your mind as well in a in a positive way um uh, so remember to keep your you know put your mask on first before trying to help others um you know and then uh something that i thought was common sense and like something my parents would tell me when i was growing up but I wouldn't give advice to patients later in life. Um, it wasn't until I found out it's actually there's a lot of good evidence behind this. It's um, developing an attitude of uh, gratitude and a formal way to um, put that into play in your life would just be to do something simple like write three things down every night before you go to bed that you're grateful for. And what you'll find that if you do that over enough, uh, over a long enough period of time, you begin developing a list of all of the things that are impactful and, and um, full of like purpose to you and a sense of gratitude. And that is an antidote, okay, to anger, rage, and depression, okay? If you can harvest um, uh, these type of um, um, like attitudes. So yeah, being a, a, a humble and, you know, um, grateful person by, again, kind of uh, religiously making that part of like your own personal wellness plan. Anything you wanted to add to ways to keep someone well hard? I think I, I totally agree with, with you, Aaron. And um, I keeping your own wellness, like for myself, when I'm when I do have some rough days, I try to listen to music or I go to the gym or I, I like cooking. So I I um, I just keep myself busy in a way which is not like medical related or work related. So I I try to leave. Um, I've I guess after my intern year, I, I really taught myself that um, in order to have no stress when I come home, which is kind of hard to do, but um, just to um, I try to leave my work at work, and I come home and I try to just be myself, but there there have been days where I couldn't do that, where I was still trying to think about a patient that I saw who's having a hard time, but still try to, um, you know, separate myself by, like I said, doing certain activities that I enjoy, maybe going for a walk. Um, sometimes I, my gym has a sauna, so I usually just go there and I sit there to just relax. So they just find your ways where you can be, uh, you know, just, that can relax you. There are a lot of apps as well as, uh, as well on the phone these days. Like there's a mindfulness app, there's a sleep app if you're having trouble sleeping. So I, I would say make use of those is uh, making use of that those kind of apps that are available and are helpful um, is, is a very good way to just keeping your own wellness in check. Great. I'm going to move to some questions. Okay. Um, one is, can you talk briefly about some of the new cutting edge treatments for depression? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, you know, I think the gold standard is still, um, you know, uh, for mild depression, you know, starting with some talk therapy, conservative approach. Um, um, if that's not effective enough, then sometimes we integrate into uh, talk therapy and medication. Um, as part of that, in addition to lifestyle, you know, ch ch changes that we're recommending, you know, people do for themselves to stay well, it can help pull people out of depression. Um, uh, if medication and therapy is not uh, helpful alone, um, 
uh, you know, then there's there's uh, neuromodulation uh, treatments um, that uh, you can do. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation. You sit in a chair. There's a magnetic coil. MRI technology targeted uh, at the part of the brain that is we think is responsible for the mood. Um, there's that treatment, uh, which many people find helpful. Um, they do it a lot at the VA um, hospital and some other uh, institutions. It's more of an outpatient thing than an inpatient thing. Um, uh, at Intermountain, the organization I work for, we wrote the protocol for ketamine for, for uh, Lippincott. Um, that can be delivered. Uh, this is a disassociative anesthetic um, created in 1970. Um, uh, for surgical purposes and uh, as a consequence of using it for so many years in surgery we realized people were coming out of surgery less depressed and so they kind of started looking into that and found that one of the medications in the anesthesia and the anesthesia cocktail was ketamine and um, this pro provides like pretty immediate benefits uh, to get suicidal thoughts out of your mind um, so usually within an hour after uh, IV ketamine has been administered um, the furthest thing that people are thinking about in their mind is, uh, you know, suicide. It just has a great, uh, people have a great response um, to that. Um, it's not right now approved for long-term use of treating major depression. Um, we use it as a bridge therapy to bridge someone from like a medication or a talk therapy onto a new medication, but to get them feeling better uh, now. Um, and instead of taking that three to six weeks, that, that can sometimes, uh, well, that you know, uh, antidepressants actually do take you know, to generally start working. Um, another promising treatment cutting edge that's on the, you know, uh, in phase two and three clinical trials is uh, 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 psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in uh, magic mushrooms. Um, uh, it's actually not the, the, the chemical um, that's the psilocybin itself that's responsible for improving people's depression. It's uh, at a large enough dose, it's the mystical experience that people has, a religious experience. And uh, they did a lot of great research at Hopkins and NYU. Um, Roland Griffiths is the, um, the, the researcher um, that, that uh, um, you know, kind of brought the, the psychedelics back into clinical research um, as they're still controlled uh, schedule one substances, uh, you know, illegal. So um, uh, we expect uh, psilocybin to be, uh, I guess the experts in the field expect that treatment to be available by clinicians, um, you know, in the next two years. So that's exciting. Um, uh, MDMA is another uh, treatment for um, that's being researched uh, primarily right now for PTSD. I've seen a couple studies um, with depression. Um, psilocybin is being given in one large dose, and then that is thought to cure uh, many people's depression, whereas MDMA takes several treatments. All of this, by the way, is uh, guided with uh, therapy. So you're getting therapy while you're having these altered uh, states of consciousness, okay? It's not just you take the drug and they throw you in a room and call it a day, you know? So it's it's uh, there's more to it than just the, uh, the medication. Um, hmm. So psychedelics, ketamine, neuromodulation. Um, can you think of anything else, uh, Harky, that's kind of on the cutting edge or? I think the other thing is ECT, but like that's... Yeah established yeah been around a while but works good um for sure uh and uh i think that was one of the things that came to mind um there's some promising research right now with uh hormonal treatments um so one of the novel medications i got approved recently was brexanolone which is a treatment a hormonal treatment uh, it's a steroid uh, uh, given in postpartum depression um and then there's uh looking this some, into some other uh hormonal um, uh, treatments as well um, I'll do another question here. Um, let's see. Uh, the next question is, what are some of the groups who are especially at risk? Um, I guess aside from physicians, the medical students and things that we talked about, um, such as LGBTQ. Um, is there anything a new doctor should know about treating this community with compassion? Have you ever had to deal with LGBTQ teenagers who live in conservative areas and have unsupported families who are suicidal. Well, for sure. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I think uh, you're hitting on a good point. Um, so uh, Dan Reynolds, the lead singer of Imagine Dragons, um, uh, ha made a movie about this uh, kind of very topic with um, this marginalized population, LGBTQ population. Um, and the challenges that they face in the state of Utah, where I practice, um, which is a Mormon community. Well, I think 50% of the 
the uh, citizens are Mormon um, and uh, are, I would say, kind of similar in their views as other maybe Christians, um, uh, you know, with respect to, you know, these um, alternative lifestyles. Um, and so uh, despite increasing efforts towards tolerance and acceptance at an institutional level by these religious organizations, and um, there still seems to be increasing rates. And that's a real, like, people are trying to figure that out. So there's, um, you know, concerts and parades and, you know, a lot of people rallying behind, you know, uh, this marginalized group, but it doesn't seem to be affecting outcomes. And so it's uh, multifactorial, you know. Um, other groups that are particularly at risk, I mean, uh, I mean, if we want to go into that, um, it's really like uh, uh, bimodal. Um, so uh, beginnings of life and end of life, you know, like uh, 19, 20 and younger um, before brains reach full development um, is at an increased risk. Um, and then as people are retiring, you know, uh, 65 and older are another group of people that are at an increased risk um, for suicide generally the years of uh, when you're accumulating things and a career and work and raising kids and things like that um, those are uh, more protective but definitely people do in their life in those years too um, but not as much as the other uh, the other you know age groups um, I'm gonna let Harky take this next question because she's closer to this than me the question is can you talk about what's expected of a psychiatrist of a psychiatrist in residency is it getting harder to obtain a psychiatry residency? I think I, I, I mentioned that already. It's extremely uh, competitive. You have to get pretty good scores and do a little bit of research. And, um, you know, um, to be, I mean, the numbers when I was in training, uh, you can tell me if they've changed. Hard. We trained the same program, by the way. Um, when I was chief, uh, we were getting about 1,600 applications. And then we interviewed 100 and then we hired eight or nine. So to go from 1600 to hiring eight to nine is tough uh, in terms of the the, um, the process, but doable. I mean, as you can see, uh, you know, we're, we're here today, so you, you know, you can do it too. Um, but they are, I'd say the entire field is good at picking out people that don't have a passion for this. It's not like it used to be many years ago where eh, you can't do anything else. I guess I'll do this. It's, that's like those days are long gone. What's expected of a psychiatrist in residency right now, Harky? Um, like what's expected? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's it's just it's like I mean, what's expected from any other field of like um, you know from from a resident? It's it's I I would say like your first two years as a resident of. So psychiatry is, um, it's four years and your first two years are really heavy uh, towards your inpatient psychiatry. Um, you do a lot of call and you then you move on and then you have some medicine rotations, you have rotations in neurology. So you kind of, I think what's expected is just, just be on top of your game. I think that's the main thing. Like you you kind of need to like when when you get more focused into just inpatient psychiatry for like let's say you're, you're you're there for three months and then you have to switch gears to all of a sudden to internal medicine rotations now kind of have to make that switch and i think just um, that's kind of one of the things that's expected and the other thing is just um uh i like the hours in the first two years are quite similar to any other uh, field of med uh, i guess residency kind of gets easier when you get to your third and fourth year because in third year you do pretty much all year of outpatient rotations and you do, really don't really go into inpatient much fourth year is all elective so as long as you are learning and you are doing well um, the, in our program here we have um, evaluations every every rotation um, you get CSVs done, which, you know, um, it's a clinical skills verification forms that needs to be, I think you get like four forms, four forms that you need to be filled out and is a requirement by the ACGME board in order to graduate. So just to meet the criteria and keep learning, um, asking questions from your preceptors. And I think that all of that is expected. It's just more towards how much you want to learn. Uh, if, 
you know, that's just what's expected, I guess, from, from psychiatry as a resident. Yeah. Um, right. I think like hours and stuff is, uh, at least the maximum amount of hours is, um, uh, regulated now by ACGME pretty tightly, um, uh, to prevent like uh, resident abuse. And then also, um, there's these pretty, um, pretty impactful, uh, I can't remember who it's through, Harvey, if you remember, um, these are questions that residents answer about their own residency program once a year. Um, which affects their, um, uh, their, if they can be an ACGME certified residency and, um, kind of what their standing is. And so it, it has an influence on that. And, um, is that, is that an ACGME, um, survey or? Yeah, it's the ACGME it? okay. survey, yeah. Yeah. So this is something that you can self-report. It's anonymous. Um, and so that kind of that's like a good check and balance in terms of you know what's keep being sure that you're not being uh abused you know uh your time and your efforts um but it's uh it's a, my pro you know our program was great uh it just stretches you trains you you know, well you're prepared to really see and you know anybody i think uh you know regardless of how how sick or well they are um by the time you come out you feel pretty confident in that um did you get any uh, questions yeah. like you texted can, to you or not? Um, okay. I can go. To, uh, so my question was, how did you feel uh, UMHS prepared you and uh, why did you decide on psychiatry? Um, did you know before you went to medical school or while you were going through medical school? So um, I think UMHS did prepare me well for, um, especially for psychiatry. I. So for me, I took a lot of gap years before going into medical school. I worked for about three years before um, before starting school. So I was working in Massachusetts in a detox center where I um, had an opportunity to work with a lot of psychiatry residents, a lot of psychiatrists, like uh, fellows as well, who were doing their addiction psychiatry there. Um, so that's kind of where I, uh, my interest in psychiatry, um, I guess, started. But it wasn't until, um, I, I would say it wasn't until my medical school rotations in psychiatry when I had decided that this is what I wanted to do. And um, I got very lucky. All my rotations for psychiatry were um, in Oklahoma. And I did my core rotations there. I did my all of my psychiatry electives there. I did an AI there. Um, so which I, I was there for a stretch of time. And I think um, just having that um, given to me by our school was very beneficial because not very many people get to do electives in child psychiatry or forensic psychiatry you know addiction psychiatry i was able to do all of those so that was that kind of really um helped me just make up my mind that yes this is what i wanted to do and um, um so i would say like i kind of knew before going to medical school but then it was more towards when i did my third year rotation and fourth year electives in psychiatry is when i really decided that this is what i want to do and uh, yeah that then there was no going back from that. Uh, my next question was, um, I saw your interview in the blog. Can you tell us briefly what a primary care doctor should do, should look for and um, when it's necessary to refer a patient to a psychiatrist? Um, so the answer to that is, so for, um, for us as a psychiatry residents, um, I think the main thing the primary care doctor should look for um, in in order to refer a patient to us or to um, inpatient psychiatry or outpatient psychiatry or their bridge access clinics that we have here in, in Ohio is just the primary indications, primary signs of why um, the what the patients are reaching out for, because sometimes they and they have depression can be uh, like I said, like there can be dep depressive symptoms. They can have depression with um, there's mild, moderate, severe depression. Depression can be with psychosis as well. They can have features of um, 
just adjustment disorder so all of these things i think just to keep that in mind is sometimes i mean primary care doctors do a great job in triaging the patients are on medic on uh, mental health but i think just as soon as they the, the patients open up and 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 explain it to them that this is kind of what they need help with or sometimes the patients don't even say it but like doing the, the phq9 questionnaire with your patients i think that can help you prompt to um uh, refer the patients to the psychiatrist um as soon as possible um that i think is 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 the tool that can be used by the primary care providers um and also can you tell us about some of the issues you face in the bridge clinic at case western when you are in the process of referring a patient um so i haven't i think um for me i've I have not faced any trouble with the Bridge Clinic. I think it has been quite helpful and accessible because we now do um and when the patient is referred to us for, by a primary care through Access Clinic that we have here, we get to see the patient right away. We get to uh, interview the patient, uh, make any medication referrals to the patient right away and then we right back to the primary care providers that this is what our recommendations are and this is what we're going to do with the patient this is the medication we're starting them on so the way the bridge or the access clinic for us work is we see the patients for 3 to 4 appointments and then we either refer them back to the primary care doctors for medication management or we if if we think that there needs to be followed up by outpatient psychiatrist for long term basis then uh, we do that and also refer patients to therapy so i really have not faced any um any issues with the bridge clinics as well and some of the other bridge clinics that we have in our outpatient community clinics that we 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 work at is um if the patient is getting discharged from the hospital and let's say the the primary psychiatrist is busy or their appointments are full then they get referred to us as bridge clinics and we get to see the patients sooner rather than like them waiting for like 2 to 3 weeks so uh from the hospital if the patient's getting discharged the bridge appointments usually with us in the next within the next 4 to 5 days so we are able to um see how they're doing after their discharge and if they need any further medication changes or they need referral to any other community resources so that's one of the other things that we do so i don't per se feel there is any frustration or there is any issues with that it's it's a very smooth clinic that we have we have therapists available we have residents we have um preceptors who are there with us um um so i i think it's one of the one of the nicest tools that we do have in our in our program especially because uh um access clinic has been i think one of the one of the easiest way for us to reach out to the community uh when uh, when their outpatient psychiatrists are uh, you know there if there is like backlog on their appointments uh and next question was um uh, from your experience so far are there any mental health issues that affect women more or men do men tend to be less open to talking about mental health um that's a very good question <laughs> i mean i um i have done a lot of my focus in we have women's mental health clinic in our in our department where you can see a lot of uh, females um from any age from like like you know adult i i am more interested in adult psychiatry so we have college females coming there we have females who have like better females we have female with intimate partner violence so we i i feel like and then there's postpartum like depression or anxiety and there's psychosis i've seen like a vast number of females in that way but i i don't i would say that men and women are equally affected when it comes to um the mental health but it's it's true sometimes guys tend to not show their vulnerable side as females do so it can be a little bit hidden um but i would say that um from my experience so far as a resident i have seen equal amount of males and females in my clinics that i treat so i um 
don't really think I would say it's kind of equal, but yes, men do tend to um, hide their emotions or um, their feelings more. Women are more women are more vocal and uh, expressive um, than males are. But other than that, I don't really think that it's more common. Mental health is more prominent in females over males. I, I don't. Do you have anything to add on that, Aaron? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I don't know in the last, you know, seven, eight years um, if that's changed or not. I, I'm so I'm not up to date on the, the statistics. I was taught that. Um, uh, so I, I believe that men and women are impacted equally by mental illness. However, to get a formal diagnosis, it's more common in, in women to have a formal diagnosis uh, than men for a mental illness. Um, but impact impacted by a mental illness whether you're diagnosed or not i think like it's probably close to equal um one thing is certain though and that is uh there's a disproportionate amount of men who complete compared to women uh, when talking about suicide and um part of that might be because as you said maybe women tend to be a little bit more expressive verbose open to communicating these things which can be as we talked about before with therapy and stuff very uh, uh alleviating you know of symptoms um, especially in mild to moderate um, uh, however like if you know the men tend to complete more um, so it's a you know you're when you're doing a, a formal risk assessment uh, you know if you're a man that's you're at a greater risk than a woman for dying you know what I mean so there's no kind of debate there um, uh, as far as I agree with, you know, like women are going to be disproportionately affected by domestic abuse, um, uh, by obviously, you know, like postpartum, like depression, um, but humans in general, we're neurotic. I mean, every one of you guys is, we're all, we are, you would, you wouldn't have made it to this level, um, of where you're at. If you didn't have attention to detail, you didn't, you, you weren't a worrier, you weren't concerned about your performance, right? And this neurotic trait that can be um, productive uh, and helpful to you if you achieve your goals, you know, taken further along the spectrum to the extreme um, can be uh, a risk factor for suicide. You know, the uh, high anxiety, severe anxiety uh, is one of the most uncomfortable human sensations, uh, feelings that someone can have. Um, and so uh, nobody wants to, you know, some people um, a lot of people that uh, die by suicide don't don't have depression, you know, they're just going through a, di a distress, a, a breakup, um, you know, symptoms haven't even been around that long for more than a week or something. And, you know, now they're dead because they were distressed um, or somebody has severe generalized anxiety disorder, cannot get it under control um, on their own or maybe with help. And that, you know, uh, puts them at a, at, a, at a risk too. you know, higher, higher risk than somebody who just has depression, but no anxiety, uh, for example. Um, it's also thought that in uh, psychotic disorders, um, a lot of the, uh, they're the a high risk category um, for suicide uh, is because of the anxiety that goes with, um, you know, some of the paranoia and, uh, you know, the perceptions that are distorted, that's very anxiety provoking. Um, and that can also kind of predispose somebody, but. Um, so my next question is, um, what can we do to uh, lessen the stigma of mental health? Um, I think um, some of the things that you can do to lessen the, the stigma for mental health is just talk openly about mental health. It's not, it's not, um, I, I think I had mentioned that earlier as well, just like we go to our annual checkups, um, just mental health is part of the same it should be um talked more openly the same way and educate educating yourself and others is also one of the ways you can lessen the stigma or be also be conscious about your language i, I think that uh, that that can be very helpful or like just encourage equality and you know between physicians other physicians and mental health mental illness and just educate i think educating your um patients or educating your friends, family, your neighbors, whoever 
about mental health can can really lessen um, the stigma and be honest uh, with yourself and and others and about the treatment as well i think um, all of these factors can can help reduce the stigma behind mental health it's okay to seek help it's okay to seek counseling it's okay to to be on um, on uh, psychotropic medications there's not there there are pros and cons but like i said we we prescribe medications for hypertension the same way we prescribe medications for depression as well so um, i think that um, is quite um, the way we can lessen the stigma behind mental health is just be more spreading more awareness um, and education I, i would say are the are the key ways to, to reduce, reduce the stigma. And I just want to add one thing there. Um, uh, you know, in the, the question that you had earlier, which was how does a, when does a family practice or primary care physician know when to recommend a psychiatry? I think that kind of ties into this stigma question, um, which is, uh, I mean, the, the way I would answer that is um, primary care does an amazing job. At treating the common right the horses not the zebras but the horses right at these these presentations they're very good at uh you know four to five medications and referring to counseling right and when someone's treatment resistant or concerning or they feel like they're outside of their scope uh is when you make that referral okay um but look 25 of americans have been on an antidepressant at one point or another in their life I mean, that's, that's huge. Uh, that, that's a lot of people. Um, so, you know, like one in four, right, you know, um, have experienced something that would warrant, uh, whether it's an anxiety disorder or a phobia, social anxiety. So this is extremely common stuff. And I think that the one, you know, a way to destigmatize it just by doing what we're doing right now. Just kind of talking about it openly. Told you I've been in therapy. Told you I've lost patients to suicide. Uh, t- tell you it hurts. You know, just kind of like airing that and um, getting more comfortable because moving it from your thought and mind, anything that's a taboo, the way you get it to not be taboo any longer is by discussion, you know, uh, exposure therapy, so to speak, right? To, to talking about mental health, um, uh, you know, just makes it um, more digestible, more digestible and, and more comfortable to, to, to bring up. It says that, um, I, I think this is a leading question to that is, I know many people who won't even talk about being depressed or filled with anxiety because others will think they're crazy. What can we do to help people like this? So uh, again, I think it's just um, being open and uh, just, I guess, listening to these people and help them understand that seeking the treatment is, um, um you know there is there is no harm in that and just um i know like we we use the word crazy just like 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 that sometimes but it's not i i would i, I would personally just still be um i guess be more empathetic and uh to to patient to people like those who think that oh if i go to a psychiatrist people think i'm crazy but um that's what we need to work that's where education comes uh, in handy and that's where like i guess just the awareness comes in handy is then when you, when we discuss when we talk that there is nothing wrong with seeking help seeking mental help um especially um i think that's the way we can um kind of reduce this i guess norm where people think that oh if you're going to see a psychologist a therapist okay maybe she's having like some issues or whatever i think that's just um just to break that cycle that pattern that you know s- s- mental health is very important and i is is the way to go i believe like that's how we can help each other out and that's kind of what i would say yeah last thing i'll add on that is um listen even if you're not going into psychiatry i already talked about family practice the running joke is that they they see more psychiatry than psychiatrists do okay uh so it's like that common like they're they're dealing with it much more often than uh you know 
sometimes we, you know, we are even, uh, because virtually on every one of maybe someone who has chronic, a, a chronic condition, you know, um, it's going to impact, uh, their worldview and how they feel, you know, about themselves and, uh, their life and things like that um uh, uh, you know for those who are thinking about going into other fields and thinking hey, you're not going to have to deal with this um you're wrong um i just i was consulted yesterday from cardiology who uh they a woman had a, a, a end stemi and um they needed a catheter and uh which meant that she was going to need to be on anticoagulants and statins and you know the full protocol and they wanted to know if i thought she would be compliant I don't have a crystal ball, but I did the consult. Okay, uh, if, if you know, I thought she'd be, you know, uh, after the procedure, she'd be compliant. You know, it did, you know, did, uh, you know. So cardiology is asking, you know, um, urology. They're the sex doctors, right? They see you for men, at least. They they see uh, erectile dysfunction. This can be many times psychogenic. You know, they order psych consults. Uh, hospitals for sure, right? Um, they they're seeing, um, you know, people that have. Are in the ICU after a failed suicide attempt. So, no matter what field you go into, okay, barring pathology uh, that I can think of, you're going to be working with patients that um, you know have psychiatric illness. Not everyone, but a large crime. So this destigmatization, getting the you know improving your your communication skills uh with folks like this and, and you build it more importantly getting comfortable yourself with it uh will put you know your 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 patients at ease uh with it i think um one of the other things that i i wanted to add on to is like joining a support group can also be very helpful um you know just uh, i don't i know like in medical school it's kind of hard to find we are each other's support, I guess, but like telling your patients um, is or helping them join join any kind of support group is so that they don't isolate themselves. I, I think um, sport groups can be much helpful where you can be a little bit more open when you see other people around or, or who are maybe dealing with similar issues or similar uh, problems. And just, I, I guess it can open up uh, your chance of talking as well um, if people don't tell anybody about their struggles with mental health, like, you know, it's hard to, no one can really help them then. So I think uh, joining, like having that uh, availability, there are like many local and national sport groups that are available. Um, and just giving that awareness to your patients is also a very helpful way of uh, uh, being there for them. Well. I, I uh, you know, just want to thank everybody who, who came out. Uh, did you have any more questions you want to answer, Harkey, or are there? Um, I think I'm good. Are we good? You're good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you anyone who, who's joined us on this Facebook Live session. Um, this is the first time Harkey and I both have done uh, anything on Facebook Live. Um, uh, so we hope that you heard at least one thing that could be helpful to one of your colleagues, uh, either now or in the future, maybe a loved one even. Um, and uh, one of the comments I think was um, asking for our email addresses. I'm, I'm definitely happy to interact with you guys on uh, individual basis. Um, uh, what I don't know is the best place to, to push those out. I think on Facebook, I don't want to put it, um, it unless it's like a closed group. So maybe um, we'll let the UMHS decide how to get those, that the, maybe our contact information out. Um, in a, in, a, in a controlled yeah, in a controlled way um but uh good luck on the rest of your studies and i know great things are ahead of you guys stay the course we've been there uh we're done it it works umhs is a good place to prepare you for you know uh your your future career and uh that's all i gotta say great i and also like people who are on the island please uh try to enjoy yourself as well i know we we get busy with with block exams and everything else but there are nice beaches out there so which i do really miss so i think uh, please make use of your time on the island very um, nicely and get out with your friends that's also a way to just take care of yourself and it's a good wellness take maybe take a weekend off um, whenever you guys have a chance to do that um, and just do enjoy yourself while you're there because uh it's, it's a beautiful place, which I would like to visit 
sometime soon, I guess, after my residency is over. Uh, but yeah, so uh, definitely UMHS is um, is a good platform to um, you know work your way up. So uh, I would say the take advantage and ask questions, and we we are also available um, if you guys are interested in psychiatry. Uh, for sure, reach out and. Um, or if you guys have any other questions and concerns, please uh, let us know. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.